Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Welcome to the Sydney Peace Prize lecture and award presentation. My name is Jan, I will be your host tonight. It is so incredibly wonderful to see so many of you here this evening. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out on a Thursday. Yes! What a wonderful group of people. And I'm, I'm so proud and so pleased to be here um, to see this award go to an extraordinary recipient tonight. I'm sure uh, you will all be in agreement with me on that one. The Sydney Peace Prize is Australia's only international award for peace. Uh, the Sydney Peace Foundation was founded by Stuart Rees, who I believe is in the audience. Here he is, Stuart Rees. <laughs> Round of applause for Stuart. Yes. He is, he is looking humble over there, but uh, his achievements have been extraordinary for something like this to have gone on for 25 years and to recognize the people around the world in various conflicts who are standing up for peace. Um, that really did begin with Stuart, so we are very much indebted to him. I think now it is, we always say it's more important than ever, don't we, when, when we, we hand out prizes, but Given the unfolding situation in the Middle East, the conflict and the humanitarian crisis, it does seem incredibly important in these times in particular to recognize the peacemakers, the people who are... <laughs> the people who are striving for peace and for justice and who are doing so at a great personal cost to themselves and to their families. They are the guiding light in the darkness. It is my great pleasure to welcome to you, before we kick off our official proceedings, Uncle Alan Madden to give us a welcome to country. Please welcome Uncle Alan. Thank you. Once again, my name is Alan Madden, Gadigal Elder. For my first song, Married man. <laughs> Ten children. Twenty-six grandchildren and seventeen great-great. Yes, we did have TV. Just couldn't afford the bloody electricity. Born and bred in Redfern, the capital of Sydney. Aboriginal, black, Redfern, follow Manly. Nah, not true. Not true. Rabbitohs. Welcome to country to me is always an honour and a pleasure. Just to give you a little bit of an insight of where you are and who we are. As with all welcomes, firstly I'd like to acknowledge our First Nations and traditional owners of the lands that you may have come from or work upon and pay my respects. To all our Aboriginal elders, all elders, past and present, also pay my respects. To all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters, from whatever Aboriginal or island nation you may have come from, welcome to Gadigal. And to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters here this evening, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. No matter where you've come from, whether it be across the seas, across the state, or across town, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. Uh, and as I've mentioned many times before, was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. <laughs> Only three things sure than that, coming, taxation and going. It's an honour and a pleasure to be here this evening to welcome one and all the Gadigal. 
Gadigal is one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bounded by nature's own. The Hawkesbury River to the north, the Pean to the west, and George River to the south. And in between those three mighty rivers is the Eora Nation. And in that nation, there are 29 clans. And the clans land we're on this evening is Gadigal. On behalf of members of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. There's an old Aboriginal saying out there, and I think it's very appropriate for you mob here this evening. They say, where there's a will, there's relatives. And as you travel across these traditional lands and waters, may the spirits of our ancestors guide, look over you, and keep you safe. So once again, on behalf of the Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Alan, for that um, incredibly warm and, and always humorous welcome to country. Um, I hope you can afford those electricity bills now. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's relatives. That's good. Um, as I said earlier, ladies and gentlemen, this is the 25th year of the uh, Sydney Peace Prize. The foundation started 25 years ago, and over the years it simply wouldn't be possible without those who have supported us in this endeavour. But this year I want to thank the City of Sydney and our patron, Lord Mayor Clover Moore. Thank you very much, Clover. There she is. Uh, keep that applause going for the University of Sydney. Thank you so much to the University for all of your support. Uh, and our 2023 partners uh, for this year, the Carla Zampatti Foundation. A round of applause for Carla Zampatti and her foundation. Uh, you might have noticed I'm in a very fabulous jumpsuit. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> No, stop, stop. Um, this was so very generously donated by Carlos and Patty. They said, will you accept payment in clothing? And I said, yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm very, very happy to be wearing her, her wonderful clothes. Truly the only person who can make any human being look good in a jumpsuit. So massive thank you to Carlos and Patty. Um, I'd like now for us to watch a video that's been put together by the Sydney Peace Foundation, um, after which you'll hear co-chairs Joy Kiriakou and Felix Eldridge address you. Take it away. The world is in a pretty dangerous place right now, ecologically, militarily, economically, politically. You know, we are off script and we don't know what to expect, which is a moment when societies are pretty vulnerable. think that our countries uh, like Australia and Canada really rest on a myth of benevolence. We paint ourselves to be champions of human rights while at home we're actively marginalizing the people that lack basic access to resources. What we've got is an environment in which we're almost licensing racist comments, intolerance, a lack of humanity. We're politically almost licensing this. The the current system has been based on the lack of capacity to really bring equity to all humans and so many people are being left behind and people are losing their spirituality and their connectivity to the land and the resources and the dynamics about how to keep things in the balance. In every aspect of our society we see these inequalities, we see how much we need to do in order to create even a basic modicum of social justice. And it means rewriting the rules of the market economy. It's not enough to just have an absence of war. We need equality. We need everybody's voices to be heard. Extraordinary leaders have powerful solutions to the world's greatest problems. The Sydney Peace Foundation amplifies the voices of peacemakers who work tirelessly for peace with justice. 
peace with justice means really at least a trinity of ideas about universal human rights, about the language and practice of non-violence, and about the vision of a common humanity. You mix those ingredients together and you finish up with peace with justice. The Sydney Peace Foundation was founded in 1998 as a not-for-profit foundation based at the University of Sydney. For over two decades, the Sydney Peace Foundation has been supported by the City of Sydney. And we are very proud to have Lord Mayor Clover Moore as our patron. The whole movement of the Peace Prize has been really important and the prize has brought out sometimes quite controversial but really significant figures who've played a role in working for peace. And, you know, the city community supported that. I'm proud of that. The Foundation awards Australia's only international prize for peace, the Sydney Peace Prize, and gold medals for human rights. Both recognise the enormous contribution of leaders and movements in empowering and inspiring people to act for social and climate justice. We need to now be the generation that makes the movement, makes the change within our world. Together we can push forward an idea. We can make our voices heard and make those in power change their ways to peace and justice. It's good to live in harmony so we can feel like a whole big family even though we're from different backgrounds. And that's what makes our world better and more colourful, more bright and more peaceful. Thank you everyone and good evening. <clears throat> My name is Joy Kiriaku. Um, and I am co-chair of the Sydney Peace Foundation with my friend, <laughs> Felix Eldridge. Um, we want to, first of all, also pay our respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, we'll have a little bit more to say um, about that later as we talk, but um, to pay our respect to elders past and present and to note that we are tonight standing on Aboriginal land um, that always was and always will be. Um, Thank you all for being here tonight. Being here tonight on this day and at this time, it is an act of standing for peace. And it is an act of standing for peace at a time when that is desperately needed. So thank you for coming um, and for standing with us. Um, and thank you also to our partners this year. Jan has mentioned them already, um, but I will just pass on as well um, from the Foundation, our, our true warm regard for our partners, the University of Sydney, of whom the Foundation is a part, um, the City of Sydney and Lord Mayor Clover Moore, um, to Amnesty International, who have been incredible working with us this year um, on, the, on everything that has led up to this week and the impact that we have had. Um, and of course, um, also to the Carla Zampatti Foundation, who's given us wonderful support um, and amazing outfits, which has been <laughs> great. Um, so, yeah, thank you all. Uh, as Jan uh, noted, the Sydney Peace Foundation was founded 25 years ago. In 1998, we, rec uh, we recognised Muhammad Yunus as our first laureate for his work supporting the economic empowerment of women around the globe. In the years following, we've honoured Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Mary Robinson, Hans Blix, Hannah Nashrawi, and, our own human, and with our own Human Rights Medal, the iconic Nelson Mandela. More recently, we've honoured movements like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and the powerful Uluru Statement from the Heart. We are so proud of that choice from last year and of the millions of Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike, who worked so hard to take our country to a place of justice and reconciliation. We must all remember tonight, that effort did not end with the referendum. We know, we are certain, that peace with justice is possible, at home and abroad, right now in Ukraine, in Myanmar, and yes, also in the Middle East. 
Our Prime Minister has said that innocent civilians should not pay for Hamas's despicable atrocities. But right now, they are paying with their lives. Israeli bombardment has killed nearly 9,000 people, most of them women and children, since October 7. We have added our voice to calls for ceasefire, but the facts are simple. The killing of civilians must stop, the hostages must be released, aid must be allowed into Gaza, and peace and justice must be pursued with urgency, because right now we are witnessing the horror of the alternative. In the words of former laureate Naomi Klein, our words our government should heed. Our moral obligation is to stand with the child against the gun, no matter whose gun and no matter whose child. The path to peace must be found, and that path starts when the bombing ends. The Sydney Peace Prize was designed not simply as an accolade, although um, our laureate this year and all of our laureates deserve plenty of accolades. Um, it is designed as an instrument. It is a way to help peacemakers to drive momentum and to push forward with their work towards peace and towards justice. In 2023, the jury decided that we wanted to honour an extraordinary movement led by some of the bravest people in the world, the women and girls of Iran. Woman Life Freedom, the slogan that emerged after the arbitrary arrest and death in custody of Masa Gina Amini, has become a global rallying cry against the gender-based oppression and misogyny at the core of the Islamic Republic regime. And despite the brutal crackdown that has seen tens of thousands of Iranians of all ages arrested, tortured, uh, and in many cases murdered by the authorities, our 2023 Peace Prize Laureate is here to deliver a message of determination and hope. It resonates with the values we all hold, the universality of the struggle for human rights and freedom, and our belief that these values will ultimately triumph. Nazanin Boniadi is a change maker that has and continues to drive the momentum of the global woman life freedom movement as a champion and an advocate. We have been honoured to, I, I was going to say work with this week, but really we've been honoured to try and keep up with her this week <laughs> um, and see up close her clarity and her passion. Um, thank you Nazanin and thank you all for being here tonight for peace, for justice and for freedom. Thank you, Felix. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker uh, from Amnesty International. Sam Clintworth is the director of Amnesty International. She is a dedicated human rights defender. Some of you may be familiar with her and her work. She's a passionate advocate for women's rights, for children's rights, for climate change, and for the rights of our First Nations peoples. She believes that human rights are the absolute answer to the world's most challenging questions. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Sam Clintworth. Thank you. Good evening. I too would like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and acknowledge that this is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. Amnesty International is proud to be the human rights partner for the 2023 Sydney Peace Prize. Amnesty is a people-powered movement of 10 million people across 150 countries and territories that challenge injustice. We have a long history of researching, monitoring and documenting human rights abuses across the world, including in Iran. In the last year since the death in custody of Masa Gina Amini, Hundreds of women, men and children have been unlawfully killed and thousands injured by security forces during protest dispersals. Tragically, only days ago, a 16-year-old schoolgirl, Amita Garawand, died after she was assaulted by an enforcer of the compulsory veiling laws. Countless detainees have been subject to torture and at least seven people have been arbitrarily executed after sham trials. Iranian authorities continue to crack down on women and girls for defying forced veiling laws and harassing families. 
but they cannot silence everyone. Schoolgirls are still protesting despite being victimised and the Iranian people are shouting to be heard. The world is watching and we are fighting for change. Across the globe, one million Amnesty members signed a petition that resulted in the UN establishing a landmark fact-finding mission to investigate and ensure accountability for human rights violations in Iran. Thousands have engaged with and shared our research documenting the crimes under international law. But zero officials have been held to account. Tonight, I and Amnesty's 10 million members stand in solidarity with Nazanin, the Women, Life, Freedom Movement and the people of Iran. Thank you, Nazanin, for your activism and for using your platform and congratulations on being awarded the Sydney Peace Prize. We will not stop until officials are held to account in fair trials. I would also like to draw attention to the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. As, be, as has been mentioned, almost 9,000 Palestinians and 1,400 Israelis have been killed since the 7th of October. More than 200 people have been taken hostage by Hamas. More than 2 million people in the Gaza Strip are struggling to survive. Urgent action is needed to protect civilians and prevent further staggering levels of human suffering. Amnesty is calling for an immediate ceasefire, for civilians to be protected, for unimpeded humanitarian aid access and for international human rights law to be upheld and respected. Join us in our fight for human rights. I am now proud to introduce what's become the anthem of the Women Life Freedom Movement, Baroye. This clip that we're about to watch is produced by Amin Palanji from the Persian Film Festival, who is here with us tonight, and I apologise if I've mispronounced your name. The song by singer and songwriter Shervin Hajipour won the inaugural Best Song for Social Change Grammy in 2023. It highlights the poverty, human rights abuses, gender inequality that is the tragic reality of life for many in Iran. It is very moving, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Thank you. برای توی کوچه رخ زیدن برای ترسیدن به وقت بوسیدن برای خواهرم خواهرت خواهرامون برای تغییر مغز ها که پوسیدن برای شرمندگی برای بی پولی برای حسرت یک زندگی معمولی برای کودک زبال گرد و آرزوهاش برای این اقتصاد دستوری برای این هوای آلوده برای ولی از رو درخت های فرسوده برای پیروز و اعتمال انقرازش برای سک های بیگناه ممنوعه برای گریه های بیوقفه برای تصویر تکرار این لحظه برای چهره ای که میخنده برای دانش آموزا برای هاینده برای اجباری برای نخبه های زندانی برای کودکان افغانی برای این همه برای غیر تکراری برای این همه شعار های تو خالی برای آوار خونه های پوشالی برای احساس آرامش برای خرشی پس از شبای طولانی برای غرصای عصاب و بیخوابی برای مرد میهن آبادی برای دختری که آرزو داشت به سر بود برای زن زندگی آزادی برای آزادی
Well, I am struggling to hold it together, my friends. It has been a, a tough few weeks. Uh, that was a beautiful video. Well, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce the recipient of the Sydney Peace Prize, the reason why we are all here gathered tonight. <laughs> Our Peace Prize recipient, as you know, is Nazanin Bonadi. She is a renowned Iranian human rights activist. She is so deeply committed to human rights, to women's rights. Uh, you might have come to her work in the last year, but she's partnered with Amnesty since 2008 to be a voice for women and for Iranian youth. Following the death of 22-year-old Iranian woman Gina Masa Amini last year, those horrible images that were beamed into our homes through our phones and our television, she was instrumental in bringing the human rights of these women into sharp focus on the world stage. She made sure that everyone knew what was happening. She put the case before the UN Security Council, the US Senate, the British Parliament and various forums across the globe. Nazanin is also an actress. Uh, she's a Screen Actors Guild and Actor Award nominated actress. And her film and television credits include the Lord of the Rings series, How I Met Your Mother, Homeland, Counterpart, Hotel Mumbai. I mention all of this because you don't see many actors and actresses being as forthright and as strong and as vocal in their convictions as she. It is truly remarkable that she is able to use such a broad platform to advocate for women in Iran. So please join me in welcoming, in congratulating Nazanin Bonadi. Thank you, Jan, for that incredibly moving introduction. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I am deeply grateful to the Sydney Peace Foundation at the University of Sydney for this incredible honor, which I receive with great humility as I aspire to the courage and strength of activists in Iran who risk their lives daily for their most fundamental freedoms. While I stand before you, my fellow artists and activists inside the country are denied their livelihoods and lives for daring to dissent. It doesn't escape me that their destiny could have easily been mine which is why I feel so compelled to use my freedoms to demand theirs. To best do that, let me take a step back. My first protest was when I was in my mother's womb. She was 19 and bravely joined my father and countless minority, actually, I should say, Iranians, who opposed the newly forming theocracy in 1979. Tens of thousands of Iranian women also demonstrated an opposition to the new government's compulsory hijab ruling. Their cries were met with violence and imprisonment. Yet, this demand for gender equality only grew stronger with time. Ayatollah Khomeini's revolutionary government executed and imprisoned thousands and exiled millions, including my parents. Although they were granted political asylum in London when I was just three weeks old. The crisis facing the people of Iran was ingrained in my psyche. And a traumatizing encounter with the so-called morality police when I visited Iran at age 12 was a glimpse into the daily indignity suffered by the girls and women of my homeland. I learned that fundamentalism and women's rights cannot coexist which is why nothing scares this regime and indeed all despots more than independently minded women. 
It makes sense that throughout history, women's participation has been pivotal in driving social and political change. And for the past four decades, the women of my homeland, Iran, have been tenaciously leading that charge in what has culminated in the first female-led revolution of our time. As you know, Iran was gripped with protests after the murder in custody of 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman, Gina Mahsa Amini, who was arrested for inappropriate hijab. Mahsa was not just a young woman, but also a member of persecuted ethnic and religious minority groups. Her killing ignited a fervent demand for justice under the banner of woman, life, freedom, the battle cry for the revolutionary protests that shook the foundation of the Islamic Republic and reverberated across the world. Three simple words that serve as a declaration of opposition to the misogynistic, murderous, and repressive Islamic Republic regime. Women have been both the spark and the engine of these uprisings. Despite the threat of unspeakable assaults on their minds, bodies, and souls, young schoolgirls have taken to the streets, removing their mandatory head coverings while chanting, we don't want an Islamic Republic. The centrality of women in this movement matters because high levels of female participation make mass movements more inclusive, non-violent, and most importantly, likely to succeed. From Brazil, Argentina, Chile, to the Philippines and 1980s Poland, history and social science scholarship have shown us that there is a direct correlation between the success of protest movements and the participation of women. And when women are on the front lines, movements are likelier to lead more, to more egalitarian outcomes. While women's rights triggered the protest, masses killing galvanized a broad-based pro-democracy uprising. Today, millions of diverse Iranians recognize that the status of women and girls is inextricably bound to the inclusive democracy they seek. And it's not just women protesting. In the aftermath of the 1979 revolution, few Iranian men showed solidarity as the Islamist regime ransacked the rights of their wives, mothers, sisters, daughters. But since last year, they have stood alongside Iranian women against a gender apartheid regime that maintains power by silencing everyone who doesn't share its intolerant ideology. Indeed, the vast majority of the protesters killed over the past year have been young men. This movement's rallying cry has captured the national aspiration. This unity terrifies a regime built on the institutionalized oppression and segregation of women. This is why leading Iranian women's rights activists and global lawmakers support efforts to codify gender apartheid as a crime under international law. Apartheid is currently only recognized as a crime in the racial context. The Islamic Republic's systemic misogyny is one of its central pillars. And as the UN Special Rapporteur on Iran, Javad Rahman, has clearly expressed, elements of gender apartheid are enshrined in both the Islamic Republic's criminal and civil laws. Current international legal conventions do not cover such state-driven gendered abuse. This has to be remedied so we can hold the regime to account. Iranian women are among the very few in the world who have fewer rights than their grandmothers did. One of the first acts of the revolution's leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, when he took power in 79, was not just to impose the forced hijab, but also to reverse women's rights in marriage, child custody, and divorce. This included lowering the legal age of marriage for women from 18 to nine. Girls that young can still be married in Iran today. Although tens of thousands of women demonstrated against the new government's compulsory hijab ruling, their cries were met with threats and violence. Among the bravest of these women was Dr. Farrokh Rup Parsa, Iran's first female cabinet minister and a pioneer in women's rights. Before being executed by a firing squad a year after the Islamic Revolution, 
Dr. Parasar wrote to her children from prison that she would rather receive death than live under the shame of forced bail. She wrote, I am not going to bow to those who expect me to express regret for 50 years of my efforts for equality between men and women. While Dr. Parsa was a trailblazer of woman life freedom, millions of micro acts of courage have led us to this day. To be clear, woman life freedom is not just about draconian dress codes, but the compulsory hijab has become the symbol of the Iranian women's struggle since it was imposed 44 years ago. For four decades now, women in Iran have not only been fighting mandatory hijab, but also for their right to choose what they can study and what jobs they can hold. Their testimony and inheritance is worth half that of a man. Women are forbidden from becoming judges or president. Despite this, women are more educated than men in Iran, both a testament to their tenacity and a driving force in their fight for freedom. But the bitter reality is that the Islamic Republic is a gender apartheid state for women who are segregated from men in the workplace, in classrooms, and at beaches, a ban from attending sports arenas, riding bicycles, and singing solo in public, and have to sit at the back of the bus. Women in Iran have no laws to protect them from gender-based violence. According to the World Economic Forum's 2022 Global Gender Gap Report, Iran ranks 143rd out of 146 countries. It's hard to believe that women in Iran won the right to vote nine years before the women of Switzerland, or that the country once had a revered national ballet and regionally renowned female pop artists. In my 15 years of advocacy, I have constantly been advised by members of the human rights community that human rights and democracy activism must not be conflated. Here's why I disagree. If the pillars of a system ensure its wrongs cannot be made right, the pillars need to be replaced. And that is exactly what the Iranian people have tried to do nearly once every decade for the past four decades. But neither the student protests of 99, the Green Movement of 2009, or the bloody November protests of 2019 compare in fervor or magnitude to the protests of the past year, which have been the greatest existential threat the regime has ever faced. Iranians know all too well the high cost of civil disobedience under a totalitarian system. Often, protesting oppressive laws means breaking them, and improving lives can mean sacrificing your own. Since the inception of the revolutionary woman life freedom protests in September 2022, hundreds of protesters have been killed, tens of thousands arrested, several have been executed, with dozens facing the gallows, and thousands of Iranians have been blinded, raped, gassed, tortured, and forcibly disappeared. And the world has moved on, as it seems the country's brutal security forces have yet again crushed the uprisings. And history repeated itself on October 1st of this year when 16-year-old Armita Garavan entered a coma after being assaulted on the metro by the so-called morality police. She was pronounced dead just a few days ago. But what the regime doesn't seem to understand is that with every injustice, it stokes the flames of resistance. While the streets may not currently reflect this, the revolutionary fire is very much ablaze in the hearts and the minds of Iran's embattled protesters. Female journalist Nazila Marufian continued to defy the regime despite multiple imprisonments by sharing a photo of herself without the compulsory hijab every time she was freed. She recently escaped Iran. Countless families seek justice for their loved ones despite threats and harassment, including Mahmounir Moulayrad, the mother of nine-year-old aspiring inventor, Kion Pir Falak, who was brutally shot to death by this regime. She reportedly lives under house arrest for daring to hold the regime to account. 
Despite grave risks to their careers and freedom, dozens of Iranian female athletes have competed without compulsory hijab. Recording artists have released protest anthems, prominent actresses have re publicly removed their veils in protest, and hundreds of thousands of Iranian women continue to flout the compulsory hijab in major Iranian cities on the streets as I speak. Despite a nationwide security Clamp down, increased arrests, snap checkpoints, and university purges. The recent one year anniversary of Massa's killing saw Iranians rise up yet again, demanding an end to the Islamic Republic. Because woman, life, freedom is more than just a viral hashtag. It's a cry, not only for women's rights, but for representative and accountable government. I draw strength from the people of Iran and I can only strive to be their conduit and megaphone. Iranians like this year's Nobel Peace Prize laureate Nagaz Mohammadi, the courageous political and women's rights ad advocate Fatima Sepehri, and prominent liberal dissident Majid Tavakoli, all languishing in jail, and human rights lawyer Nasrin Sutudeh, who was recently rearrested yet again after multiple imprisonments. They and countless others, many whose names we will never know, have shown us the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, together, we must build the tunnel. And our unity really is key. For years, the Islamic Republic has skillfully co-opted the anti-imperialist narrative, seeking to delegitimize Iranian freedoms, freedom seekers as Western stooges and deny us our agency. In response, a beloved actress in Iran, who I unfortunately can't name because I want to protect her from retaliation, wanted me to share this message with Iranian expats across the world. She says, this regime told you to leave if you don't like its oppressive laws. They persecuted you and your families into exile in an effort to humiliate you. And when you left, they tried to discredit you as being out of touch with Iran and shilling for the West. What they didn't anticipate is that, like millions of messages in bottles, your voices would carry ours across oceans, that you would echo us loudly wherever you went in the world, even generations after your parents were forced to leave. And this brings me such joy. Seeing you out in the streets of major global cities in the tens of thousands over the past year, knowing that no matter how far apart, we are an extension of each other. As long as this unity remains, we will prevail. And soon, Western politicians will also have to officially recognize the woman life freedom revolution. I hope to see you all soon in a free, secular, and democratic Iran. An Iran that is more respectful of and responsive to its citizens will no longer be the greatest ex exporter of violence and terrorism in the world. Fully free, politically active women are a threat to authoritarian and authoritarian-leaning leaders, and Iran, with an open and diverse political system, with a government that respects the rule of law and is considered legitimate by its own people, will push back against the decline in democratic democracy worldwide. Democratic decline worldwide. Good and law-abiding governance not only make for better regional neighbors, but also cooperative members of the international community. Quite simply, if the women and people of Iran succeed in achieving the freedom they deserve, this could be the most positive development for regional and global security and peace in decades. In an increasingly divided world, I want to thank my parents, my mother is here with me tonight, for instilling <laughs> for instilling in me the importance of choosing people 
over politics and dignity over dogma and turning outrage into action. And thanks again to the Sydney Peace Foundation for helping me shine a light on the brave people of Iran and uniting with us to forge a way forward for our common humanity. Thank you. Nazanin Benaidi, everybody. Thing we're both dressed by Carla Zampani, eh? Um, we've got a, a, a very um, fantastic panel discussion uh, coming up for you now. And what I might do is I might just introduce our three uh, speakers and get them to come up as one and then give you a little bit of an intro as to who each of them are. So if I can please invite to the stage Shukafe Azar, Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert, and Galeray Poor. Please put your hands together for them. Uh, Shukafe has worked as a journalist for many years in Iran. Uh, she sought political asylum here in 2011. She was jailed three times while covering stories about Iranian uh, political issues and human rights abuses. She's been shortlisted for the International Booker Prize for her debut novel, The Enlightenment of the Green Gauge Tree, set in Iran following the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Please welcome Shukafe. Next to Shukafe is uh, Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert. Many of you may be familiar with Kylie. She spent 804 days as a political prisoner in Iran. She is an expert in Middle East history and politics. Uh, she traveled to Iran to take part in an academic conference and was arrested at the airport uh, at the end of that conference and spent that time in prison. She's written a re remarkable memoir. If you haven't read it, I would uh, very much encourage you to. It is, um, it's so detailed, but it's so gracious as well um, of her reflections of that time. Please put your hands together for Dr. Carly Moore Gilbert. <laughs> uh, next to Kylie, we have Gallery Poor, who is an Iranian-born Persian Comanche and Ejak player. She's a singer and a songwriter. She's a <laughs> choir director. Uh, she got her BA at the Art University of Tehran, uh, Tehran's conservatorium, pardon me, and a master's here at the university in Melbourne. Her academic research is on the lives of Iranian women singers in the diaspora. Uh, right now she works with a variety of musicians across many genres and with a focus on new Australian music. So please welcome Gallery. <laughs> Wow, a truly extraordinary panel. I, we've got half an hour. I don't know how we're going to do it. There's so many questions and, and so much that we can talk about. Um, I want to start with you, Nazanin. Um, a, an incredible speech you gave about the movement that you've been such a champion for. It's been a year. How do you reflect back on this year? What do you think some of the successes have been? And what do you think some of the challenges have been? Well, it's good to be with you all. Um, I, I think the, the main takeaway is that the Iranian people have risen up on s so many occasions in the past four decades. And each time we've reacted, but we've never been ready. We've never been proactive in how do we support them the next time they rise up? We know they're gonna rise again. Mm. Um, that, that injustice breeds, uh, this, this kind of resistance and uprising. So we have to be ready. And for the past 44 years, we've only dealt with the symptoms of the problem when it comes to the Islamic Republic. The nuclear issue, hostage taking, um, 
and regional aggression, domestic oppression, export of terrorism, but not the cause. And that's the regime itself. For the past, for the, for the past year, the Iranian people have risen up and have said we want a secular democracy. Now it's incumbent upon us to support that not only because it's a moral imperative, but it is in the world's best interests and for global stability and peace to do so. Mm. Shukafei, I saw you nodding there uh, when Nazanin brought up the idea of being, uh, always feeling like you're reacting rather than actually driving something. What, yeah. uh, add to that for us. Yeah, I think it's a very important point that Nazanin mentioned that, but we, sh we should remember also that, uh, you know, the regime has gone, the regime has a system, regime has money, but we don't have any of them. But what we have, we have our life, we have our hope and, and our goal, and uh, it, it is something that they never can take from us. What we have is our uh, hope for our children, what will happen for my children when I die with this regime. So this is the main, uh, I think, um, 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 idea that we need to continue our uh, fight with this regime. And I, I, and I believe sooner or later we will win, but before we win, so many people will be killed. And this is the very, very sad point of, dark point of this revolution that many of us you know, we are here, it seems we are safe, in safe country, but our life, our um, heart is dead sometimes, I feel. Um, you know, every day, every morning that I open my Instagram, I see a very horrible news that just 10 days ago, one of our amazing movie directors are killed, and we all believe that it's, how it's um, kill, he killed, and his wife killed by the regime, and uh, it's not the first one. It's happened all the time in the last 44 years, and it will continue. But we have hope and we continue. We will see if soon or late we will win or not. Mm. I mean, you, you mentioned being um, part of the Iranian diaspora and being here, and your heart is there, and you know, you're looking on social media. Yeah. Talk to us, and, and Gallery, feel free to jump in as well, uh, about what, what it means to be part of the Iranian diaspora in a country like Australia, yeah. whether you feel um, do you feel entirely safe all the time? Do you feel connected? Do you feel as though you are empowered to actually make change over there? What's the experience like for you? Who want to answer? I should answer? Okay. Please. <laughs> I will answer. So I, I am a writer and I was a journalist, so I received some trades through my work. So I write about the um, political stories uh, in Iran and definitely there are so many people don't like. For the first time ever, I put Khomeini as a fictional character and as a, someone that I was able to mock him and it makes me feel so good. <laughs> and <laughs> so, <laughs> and so in this way, I had my, re my uh, revenge to Khomeini, <laughs> so, and yes, it depends on our job, I think, so I receive some threats, sometimes I feel very unsafe, even in Australia, in a safe country, and sometimes I feel, uh, because Iranian community is small and people can know you very easily, sometimes I feel, okay, I should live somewhere that no one know me and it's safe, especially my second novel, my, uh, another character that I will mock him is Khomeini, so I should be more aware, yeah. <laughs> Gallery. Um, I think as an artist, you're always connected to anywhere you live. Um, but being apart from Iran, I always felt really lucky to be able to have the culture of Iran through my music and poetry and be connected. And unfortunately, as we all know, since uh, suppression in Iran has a very long history, a lot of our um, poets have a lot of poetry about <laughs> which they've written it in jail mostly, mm. uh, as we experience it right now. So through my music, I've been able to use uh, a lot of words that basically um, reflects to what is happening in Iran. So that kind of has kept me connected. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that. Sometimes I think if I didn't have that tool, uh, how, wouldn't, how would I you know, connect? Because there's 
always, um, we can't even go back home anymore because of all the activities we've had. Uh, we, we do feel unsafe. And uh, how do we get to know how people who live there uh, feel unless it's true with the music or art that they produce in there and we yeah. actually they reflect exactly what it's like to be there because media never really you know show you what is it like to be that person to live in that country so it's kind of um it's a mutual thing that i find my connection to iran yeah i, I want to stay with that for a minute because you are a singer and a songwriter and you practice that craft in iran for many years in a country where you're not allowed to sing publicly you know um how, what was that experience like for you? Uh, it's very interesting when you live in a place that since you're born, you don't even have a role model as a woman who you see in person on the stage to say, oh, you actually can sing as a woman and stand on a stage. It's been always men. So sometimes you don't really understand how it's like if I could. So you don't feel that, um, you know, suppressed, to be honest, because you always lived that life. You've always had to be in a choir. You always, if you were on a stage as a main singer, there always had to be two other male singer sitting next to you and sing with you so your voice is not recognized as one because um, the Islamic Republic knows that as erotic. Uh, and uh, so you, when you live that way, when you are educated that way, when you, your role models had to be on a stage that way, you don't feel what is it like to be different. But when you move out and you experience that, you find yourself and you realize how controlled these actions being even as a woman not to be able to sing, this reflects to every bit of your life. You don't even get to understand yourself. As an artist, yeah. I play instrument as well, but singing's been a big part of my practice, and it is. But I've never been able to even dare compose my own things when I was in Iran, because I didn't feel that I'm capable of. So this sort of suppression takes the capability of you as well, and you start feeling, Maybe that's how I have to be. Maybe, and that's, I think that's part of the tool that the Islamic Republic is using right now because people don't know how it's like to live different. Mm. You know, uh, what, how, who are we? What are we capable of? They don't give us the chance to even understand that. And that is a big part of this revolution. I mean, it's very successful, but it's dragging because people inside Iran, they just, they haven't found the tools, they haven't, they haven't even, they don't even have a chance to know themselves and their capabilities, but they're really powerful, we all are. But you know, and uh, it's kind of impossible. Yeah. It's very difficult. Kylie, um, I want to come to you in, in a moment, but if I can go to you, Nazanin, because when, when we see these images of these women in the streets who are protesting and removing their hijabs and getting beaten and getting arrested at great cost to their lives and to their bodies and to their families. Um, it's an extraordinary thing to witness. And you mentioned that this is the first women-led revolution. That is extraordinary. Talk us through why it's women that have taken up this mantle in particular and what it means that this is a women-led revolution. How does that make it different? So, I think I, I tried to capture it in, in my speech, but essentially the spark and the engine was women. Young Mahsa was killed because of inappropriate hijab, and she was also a member of religious and, minority, uh, and ethnic minority groups. I think her youth, the fact that she was a woman, and, and the fact that she was a, a Sunni Kurd, uh, lent itself to people understanding the intersection of, of the plight of women and the oppression of women to what other groups in Iran, minorities in Iran, disenfranchised groups in Iran are facing. Um, but the engine was also women. People like Nikoshah Karami, Sarina, 
who took to the streets, these young girls mm. who flouted the compulsory hijab in solidarity with Massa, set their compulsory hijab ablaze, shouted death to the dictator, and were killed. And honestly, what we're seeing is a contagion of courage. And it stems from 44 years ago when Dr. Farouk Ruparsa and her legacy of, of defying uh, this kind of oppression. But recently in 2017, there was the Girls of Revolution Street. And you know, that's where really the protests against compulsory hijab started. This has been, this is not an overnight movement. This is something that's been 44 years in, in the making. But I think the reason why it has been different this time is that men have stood shoulder to shoulder with women mm. and sacrificed themselves even more than, than women have actually. Died more, they've been, they've, they've been killed more. And, um, and this unity petrifies a regime that really has built itself on segregating and oppressing women. The segregation oppression of women and gender apartheid is a pillar of this regime. When it crumbles, the, I believe that the regime will crumble. Mm. Shukafe, is there anything you'd like to? So as a seven years old that introduced to regime, I was just seven years old when the regime came to Iran, I remember the first thing that I understand was about this regime was that the regime changed and now then you girls should cover your hair. So it was, I then later I understand that the whole regime, ident whole regime's identity is on base of my body. Mm. My body means that if I cover my body, Islam is protected. If not, Islam is not protected. If I receive, uh, I don't know, if I want to just divorce, um, uh, should, should follow all of the Sharia laws, seven, seven rules. It's seven rules that you should tick one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then maybe judge say, yes, you are allowed to divorce. So, and then later, as a journalist, I was a woman that all the time, I get arrested more than men journalists. And so I thought that this regime is all about me. There is no any other definition about this regime. So you never hear that Islamic regime is a kind regime that wanna, you know, mm. equal system, bring equal system. There is nothing like that. So I little by little started hate Islam. I know no one wanna listen to this, but the Islam that I experienced, the Sharia law that I experienced as an Iranian woman, it's make me to think, okay, thank you very much. You are beautiful, but I don't want you. Just leave me alone. You see? So, and then later, it was 2004, I finally divorced, tick all of that seven thing. <laughs> and I immediately said, I wanna just walk. So as an Iranian woman, you cannot just make decision to walk. Always some men should carry with you, some men, father, brother, you know, someone. And I said, okay, then I want to go out of Iran and walk. I went to Afghanistan, walk to Afghanistan, and then Tajikistan, Kirkizia, I don't remember, um, 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 Tajikistan, and India, Pakistan, China. And I saw so many different versions of Islam in all of these countries. Islam in Tajikistan was so nice, I didn't feel it. Everybody had their lifestyle, and nobody asked you to do this, to do that. No Sharia law has a power in the government. This is the most important part. And then Islam in Pakistan was horrible. Islam in Afghanistan was worse than all of them. And I find out that, you know, Islam is depend how the political people want to interpret that. Mm. <coughs> Sorry. But it didn't make me feel better than about Islam. It makes me feel to, I want to read more about Islam. I read so many books about Sharia law, about um, uh, Tozihul Masail. How we can translate Tozihul Masail? <laughs> Tozihul Masail is a book that Mullahs write about their definition about Islam and Sharia law. So, and I hate it more. But in the end, 
left in me that make decision, okay, I don't like Islam, I don't like Sharia law. And maybe if I was living in Middle Age, like 15th century, I had the same feeling about Christianity. When politics and religion comes together, it's horrible. So, well, yeah. Thank you. I think you could probably say things about yeah. Christianity in, in this day and age, to be fair, if, if, if you really wanted to. Um, but let, let me just yeah, go, go to Kylie yeah. on this, because you, know, you, you spent time, um, I don't even say, no, if you can say you spent time in Iran, you spent time in a prison in Iran, that's a very particular experience. Um, but I was struck by something that you wrote in your book about the extraordinary friendships that you were able to form with so many women in the prison with you. Talk us through what you learnt from the women that you met in that prison and how you, as an Australian who is no longer there, can continue to support them. I learnt the truth of what we are all seeing here tonight on this stage and in this room, and that is Iranian women are remarkable people, remarkably strong. <laughs> in spite of all of the extreme difficulties that they've faced, some of which uh, Shaku Fejan just mentioned, they don't stop fighting. They stand up every time. It's actually, it blows me away. And I struggle to think of another country in the world where I've actually seen such strong and powerful women that despite the extent of, you know, the, the grievances that they might harbor, they still stand up and they keep fighting, even inside a prison. There's a reason why some of the most recognizable leaders um, within Iran and outside of Iran, like Nazanin here today, are women. The opposition leaders of this movement are women. People like Nasrin Sutudeh and Nages Mohammadi, who was recently awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, they're in prison right now. Everybody in Iran respects them and knows who they are, or most people other than the regime, of course. So we have this paradox, really, where you have this quite medieval attitude of the regime, which quite genuinely sees women as being lesser to men. You know, it's not just something encoded in Sharia law. These guys believe it. You know, I lived alongside revolutionary guards, so the more extreme elements of the regime. For more than two years, I, I had many conversations with them. Most of them genuinely believe that a woman's place is lesser than a man's. Yet you have this paradox where you have an an extraordinary number of women leaders inside the country and outside the country that are looked up to by both women and men and really, you know, disprove that assertion. So, you know, I, I guess I learned about the courage and strength of Iranian women and obviously befriended quite a lot of them whilst inside and um, I dedicated my book to two really, really dear friends, my sisters. Um, I, I see them as Niloufar Bayani and Sepide Kashani, who, for me, you know, their solidarity, their friendship, the strength that, that they gave me in, in that horrible dark place is, is something I can never forget. Mm. How do you continue your... I mean, if, if, if you are a woman living in Australia, for example, and this is a, a, an issue that moves you and you want to connect and you want to do something, what, what should you do? What is your advice to Australian women who want to keep the momentum of this movement going? It's very difficult on the other side of the world from Iran, here in Australia, let's face it, we're not the most consequential country in world affairs. It's very difficult for what? us to... I'm sorry, you know, newsflash everybody. Um, <laughs> Uh, we like to think that we're the centre of the world, but perhaps we're not. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, it doesn't mean we don't have any power and our voice doesn't matter. And, you know, I'd echo what Nazanin was saying, which is we all have a vote. We do have influence within our own polity here in Australia. We can call our MPs, we can demand that our government do more, they can list the Revolutionary Guard as a terror organisation. That is a fairly easy step for them to take. It might involve a small legislative change, but that's something they do all day. That's what we elect them to do at the end of the day. Um, so that's one thing we can demand. And we can continue to keep the message of women, life, freedom alive. It's fallen out of the headlines in recent days or in recent weeks, 
Um, we can continue to talk about it. We can continue to attend events like this. We can show our solidarity with the brave women and men of Iran and show them that they're not alone. Mm. On that point, I want to come to you on this, Nazanin. The, um, one of the sort of really important pillars of, of this revolution, and I know you said this is not just an online revolution, and that's true, but the internet has been so fundamental in being able to galvanise, uh, to uh, coordinate, in being able to get the message out to people and to show the world exactly what is going on. It can also be a vehicle for regime propaganda and for misinformation. And it's also something that is controlled by the regime in Iran. They can turn it on and they can turn it off when they feel like it. How do you navigate such a fraught space that you need in a movement like this but have no control over? You're right, it's a complete double-edged sword. I mean, with the advent of smartphones with cameras and social media, uh, the Iranian people became essentially citizen journalists and they shared images and videos. We all remember from 2009 that harrowing image and video of 26-year-old Nedara Sultan, uh, an <laughs> aspiring singer who was shot in the chest and, and bled to death right in front of our eyes. The regime is fully aware of the power of that citizen journalism. So of course they shut down the internet in order to be able to continue killing in the dark. I want to point out here that uh, Issa Zarepour is the communications minister of Iran who is responsible for the internet shutdowns of the past year. He graduated with his PhD from the University of New South Wales. And he has two, two children were born in Australia. The EU and the US have sanctioned him. Australia has not. I think that is something that needs to be quickly remedied. But these are the things that we can do here, is ensure that those who abuse the rights of people in Iran and elsewhere are sanctioned um, and are held to account, and that people, um, you know, this, we have to provide internet access. When I said we have to be proactive, we have to find a solution for this, so that next time when the people of Iran rise up, the regime cannot continue killing in the dark. Mm. When you say find a solution, what, what do you think that is? Or at the very least, what path do you think is going to get you there? I do think that's a question for technocrats. But, you know, one thing that we started doing early on in the Women, Life, Freedom movement was looking at Starlink, VPNs. How do we ensure that we circumvent that, that shutdown? Mm. Um, we have to find a way to let these protesters organize inside Iran, but also communicate with the outside world while they're being abused, essentially. Um, and if, they, if, if the, the internet gets shut down, we don't hear what's happening and the regime wins. So that's when I say we have to be proactive. We've known about this problem for at least over a decade, and yet we've done nothing to remedy it. Mm. Do you have Elon Musk's number or...? I wish. I don't think he'd take my call. No, I don't think... No, probably not. Um, Gallery, I want to come to you because, um, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is is the message and how important it is to kind of get the message out there. What role do you think art plays in speaking truth to power and in making sure the voices of dissenters and dissidents are amplified? Uh, well, we just watched Baroye, which is which, um, won Grammy Award for the uh, most moving song for the years that um, what do, you, what do you call the, it was social? Social, social change. change. Social change. Social yes. change Grammy, yep. Um, when this song came out, Sherwin just was sitting in his bedroom, exactly how most of us were like, just sitting in our bedrooms and watching the internet of what is happening. And he basically put together all the tweets that Iranians <laughs> has put on Twitter and put it into a song which was exactly what was happening. It was what Iranian people felt. And that short little song just went viral in a few hours that they arrested him, they took it down. It had millions of views on his page. Um, that's power. It just says it all. <laughs> I think on that note, um, there is so much that 
that we can talk about and so many questions. I mean, I've got a whole list here. I didn't get through them, but that's, that's okay. On that note about the power of song and the power of art, um, we've got a very special performance for you this evening from Gallery. I heard her, yeah, give her a round of applause, please. Don't let me stop you. Um, I must say, I did hear you rehearsing earlier, and it, it, she just has a spectacular voice. Um, no I am, pressure. You know, I, I, was, I was over there crying when um, the, the video was playing, so I'm just, I'm just going to excuse myself <laughs> over this way. Um, but please put your hands together for our wonderful panellists. I wish we had more time. And keep the applause going for Gallery as she gets ready to perform for you. Just give me a second so I take my shoes off. On the note of speaking about the video you watched, the there is a beautiful filmmaker in this room who made the video you watched, Amin Palangi. So please. <laughs> I'm going to play a song called Hangman. And this is a song about a person who executes people but the anger and the sound of people um, become a very big drum and hits the drum and make him go crazy. And he cannot hide, everyone knows him. This is for him to hear it.
Gallery Poor, everybody. That was just gorgeous. I know you can hear me, Gallery. Thank you so much for putting that time in and sharing that with us this evening. This brings us to our final speaker for tonight, uh, the Lord Mayor of Sydney, Clover Moore. Now, Clover, yeah, she's here. She doesn't need an introduction. I know you all know who she is. She is the city's longest serving mayor, has long championed progressive causes uh, throughout her time, championed the environment, championed politi uh, policies that protect the vulnerable, and she's been a very big supporter of the Sydney Peace Foundation and of this prize, our patron, in fact. So please join me in welcoming Clover Moore. Welcome. Yes, that's me. I, I, please. Thank you, Jan, and uh, hello, everyone. And it's wonderful to see you all here tonight. I, want to, I too want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. And I also acknowledge the people of the many nations who live in our city. And I want to thank Galarea for that, that beautiful and haunting song. And I want to thank Nazanin Naz 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 for, um, for who she is and what she does and her wonderful words to us tonight. The Sydney Peace Prize inspires us to think more deeply about the world. Sydney has watched in horror at the recent events unfolding in Israel and Gaza. The city condemns war, terrorism and violence in any form. And we urge leaders to find a path to peace and end the cycle of violence in this region. Now more than ever, we need to reflect on our values of diversity and inclusion. Just last month, Australians voted no to recognising our first peoples in the Constitution by giving them an, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people a voice, a voice to Parliament. And in voting no, the Australian Constitution has remained the only constitution of a first world nation with a colonial or an invasion history that does not recognise its first peoples. It is shameful. But I, I, am, I am pleased that the, the people of Sydney in the, in the, in the city um, voted resoundingly to support the referendum. And, uh, and our work for First Nations justice will continue. So I want to commend the Sydney Peace Foundation on its dedication to promoting peace and honouring champions of human rights. It's been an extraordinary night and um, I am so pleased that you are all here. And, I, and I'm proud to be the patron of the Sydney Peace Foundation. And for the tw last 25 years, the city has partnered with the, with the foundation to help create a peaceful, fair, just and compassionate world. Nazanin has won many human rights awards, and tonight we are pleased to present her, to present you with the Sydney Peace Prize, as well as the $50,000 prize money. So please join me in congratulating, congratulating Nazanin Boniadi. Thank you. A round of applause for our Sydney Peace Prize winner for Clover Moore. Round of applause for you guys and for our panelists in the audience. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our evening. Um, as always with events like this, particularly when you've heard from such inspiring women, there's always that question of what can I do? What should I be doing in this moment? 
Uh, and as we continue to see the uh, carnage unfold in Gaza, in Israel, sometimes it can feel very hard. Um, to, it feels hopeless and helpless uh, being so far away and seeing injustices in the world and feeling like you can't do anything. As I said in the beginning, that we need the voices of peace now more than ever. If you have a platform, stand with those fighting for peace. If you have a platform, raise your voice for peace. I, uh, I was raised in a, I went to a Catholic school for 12 years and I, it was just drummed into me day in, day out that you can't do everything, you can't do nothing, but you can do something. There is something that you can do and I would urge you to find what it is and to do it. We're going to play you a video from Amnesty International, which will hopefully be that call to action that we all need this evening. And after that, the fantastic artist Queen G is going to serenade you into the night. So thank you so much for coming here today, for sharing this moment with us all and for being such a fantastic audience. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. in spite of all our misdeeds then we open up to our mother receive her connection to the one to the one we shelter in her embrace as darkness recedes in the light what we seek is in the The fallen ones, the casualties of immorality, the flesh of the breathless. Dedicate this to the earth, deliver the rebirth, revolutionize beings. Shall you never witness, shall you never trauma, shall you never perpetrate. Let us reinstate calm, one palm to the sun, back to originality. Acknowledge where we started, the ones who came before to the dearly departed in search of the art. Don't ever tiptoe. Make like a rainbow. Let your colors show. Then go higher. For in our hearts, we oppose the forces gathered before us, disappearance of the destroyers. I like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land we are on the Gadigal people. It's no coincidence, there's been a high vibration felt. The past has brought us in line. We must carry on the message, the healing, the solidarity. We have all been moved in the same way by the resistance, by the existence. Everyone in this image is a vessel. Let's carry on, let's carry on. Hold the light of resistance, stories of persistence Carry on the wisdom, these days we are living no difference We've been warned there's a war, how long will we mourn? Bodies born, bodies gone, people torn Too much going on, target detained, deport You give us drugs to sell the drugs that put you in the system We're still going missing, still in the prison Killing for existing, we're kicking in the building Come on, wave your hands with me from side to side everybody And raise your lights with me, come on no, you shine so bright. Take down all the bitter missions. We'll take it all the 
weights, yeah, we gotta carry on, carry on, come on, carry on. All my people keep rising. It's nothing new to me. It's confusing me. I serve communities. We can't bring unity. Repeating history. You always shooting me. Artifact looting me. I come in peace to face the beast. It's nothing new to me. It's confusing me. I serve communities. We can't bring unity. Repeating history. You always shooting me. Artifact looting me. My existence is resistance. My existence is persistence. My existence is a vision. My existence. How can I social distance my existence? See my existence, my existence Continuously, consistently the victim My existence in this system Criminally conflicted, my existence Continuously conflicted, my existence Depicted in narratives of savages My existence transcribed, my existence Come on, peace signs in the air We're gonna carry the light together We're going We're shining bright Yes Let's take down this villain mission mm. All my people carry on, carry on, carry on Come on, let's keep, yes It's nothing new to me, shit's confusing me I serve community, we can't bring unity Repeating history, you're always shooting me Artifact looting me, I come in peace It's nothing new to me Shit's confusing me. I serve community. We can't bring unity. We bring in history. They're always shooting us. They're always shooting us. Say we must carry the light. Say it. We must carry the light. Sing it with me. Everybody say it. Let's take down this villain mission. And make some noise if you want to carry on. Carry on. Let your voices be heard louder. Queen G. It's time to speak up. You want to speak up? Let's speak up together. Straight out the Nile, I'm on my queen ship Reaching through the area, coming out the stereo All my thoughts are let it go They say the world's about to blow I think they're putting on a show Watch the tape about to roll News is an intro Tell you what you're into Make it look simple It's all in the symbols Codes to obey The road to betray Better watch what you say Or get moved out the way Press play Sunday Time to pray Back to slave Monday to Friday It's a cycle Recycle A lifetime of cycles That celebrate survival If you're sick Of the same ship Take a ship Uplift Uprise You cannot shut this they came with the ruckus, they came to abduct us Middle finger up this, try to interrupt this As I sit and construct this, now it's getting destructive Speak up, reach up, where's the leaders? Step up, no rulers to feed us Get on the mat, fight back, it's time to attack We're tired of this and tired of that, huh? Speak up, reach up, where's the leaders? Step up, no rulers to feed us Get on the mat, fight back, it's time to attack Yeah, on your feet, tired of that, huh? I'm tired of exploring, no time for ignoring The calling, the dawning, early in the morning Wake up, meditate, watch the planet gravitate One with the sun, there's a taste of freedom Said let's lead them, the kingdom come Let's bring the apocalypse back to the mothership And lift up the veil, no room for betrayal This race done fail, on the sea set sail Wait to exhale, brand new breath, brand new test Let it roll off my chest and pull the it to rest Assassinate stress, Buddha job bless If you can't say yes, don't vote, take mental notes Pass the remote, channel G, I give you what you can't see I'm consciously controversy, show no mercy Separate the clean and the dirty, come on Speak, speak up, up, reach up, where's the leaders? Step up, no rulers to feed us Get on the mat, fight back, time to attack We're tired of this and tired of that, come on Speak up, reach up, where's the leaders? Step up, no rulers to feed come us on. Get on the mat, fight back it's time to attack, we're tired of this and tired of that Come on, speak up, reach up, where's the leaders? Step up, no rulers to feed us Get on the mat, fight back It's time to attack, we're tired of this and tired of that Speak up, yes. reach up, where's the leaders? We are here to unite the world Get on the mat, fight back Time to attack, we're tired of this Alright, I want you to help me out, say We're tired of this and tired of that, come on yeah, we're tired of this and tired of that. Come on. Say it. Tired of this 
I'm tired of that, huh? Speak up, reach up, speak up, reach up. Where's the leaders? Thank you. My name is Queen G, and I'm available on all digital platforms for my album, Sensible Rebel. I'm proud to say that I live a hip-hop lifestyle, and hip-hop taught me to fight the powers that be. I'm proud to be the president of Addy Road Community Center, led by Rosanna, an incredible, you know, and an incredible team of human rights activists and grassroots campaign, Racism Not Welcome. We elevate human rights, arts, culture, and sustainability. Thank you, Sydney Peace Prize, for having me. Thank you, Amnesty International, and thank you all for supporting the Sydney Peace Prize. The times we are in is critical to continue to campaign for peace. Fill the streets with a message of love, light, and peace. Apply pressure to cease fire in Gaza now. Free Palestine now. End apartheid now. Free the women and the people of Iran now. Free people all over the globe from oppression. May the future generation never have to trauma and never have to perpetrate as we collectively reinstate calm. For the ones who came before and for the ones to come, we must get justice and peace and power to the people. We are in the age of the matriarch. Global sisters, we unite. Make some noise for the global women on the rise. <laughs> women, life, freedom. May our powers unite. Thank you.